A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens Ma Part 1 Marley's Ghost Marley was dead to begin with this is no doubt whatever about that Redishar of his, of his burial was signed by the clergyman the clerk the undertaker the chief mourner Scrooge signed it the Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to old Marley was dead as a donor mine i don't mean to say i know my own knowledge that there is particularly dead what there is particularly dead about a doll now i might have been inclined myself to regard coffin now as a deadly piece of iron memory in the train but the wisdom of ancestors is in the simile belly my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it or the country done for you will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could he be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners. For I did not know how many years. Scrooge was his sole ex executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole registratory legiti. His sole friend and sole mourner, even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by a sad event. But he was an excellent man of business. The very day of the funeral, and some solemnized sur it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood. Or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. If it, we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died for the play he began, there would be nothing more remarkable when he's taking a stroll at night, the easterly wind upon his own ramparts, than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rationally turning out after dark at a breezy spot, say St. Paul's Church, for instance, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Scrooge never painted out of Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley, the firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Therefore, people knew to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered both names. It is all the same to him. Ah, but he was a tight fit his hand at grindstone, Scrooge. A squeaking, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous, generous fire, secret and self contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin, Lit blue and spoke out shrewdly his grating voice. A frosty rain was on his chin, and his elbow eyebrows, his wily chin. He carried his own low temperature always about him. He iced his office in the dog days. I didn't for it one degree at Christmas. Eternal heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth, no walk could warm. No wintry weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitter than he. No falling snow was more intent on its purpose. No pounding rain less open to entry. Fair weather didn't know where to have him. Harry's rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the, of the advantage of him in only one respect. He often came down handsome, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, gladsome looks, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars applauded him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place as Scrooge. Even a blind man's dog appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming, they would tug their owners into doorways, up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they, they said, no iron at all 
is better than an evil eye, Dark Master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. So he aged his way along the crowded paths of life, wanting all human sympathy to keep his distance. That's what the knowing ones called nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time, of all the good days of the, the year of Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It's cold, bleak, writing winter, foggy with oil. He could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon the best, their breasts, and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone free, but it's quite dark already. If it had not been light all day, the candles were flaring in the windows of the neighbouring offices, like ruddy smears upon the palatable brown air. Fog came pouring in every trink and keyhole was so dense about that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. You could see the dingy cloud come drooping down, screwing everything. One might have thought that nature lived hard by, and was brewing on a large scale. The door of Scrooge's cant house was open, where he met that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, whose dismal little cell beyond a sort of tank was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire. The screw clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it. The Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room as surely as the clerk came in with a shovel the master predicted. It would be necessary for them to part. Farewell, for Clark put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself the candle, which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he fell. A oh, Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you, cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's latest view. Came upon him so quickly as this was the first imitation ahead of his approach. Bah, said for Scrooge, humbug. As he so heated himself of rapid walking, the fog and frost, his nephew, the Scrooge, and he was all in a glow, his face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, his breath smoked again. Christmas, sir, I'm back, Uncle, said Scrooge in effort. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas, you right. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You poor enough. Come on, then, joined the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Cruz may have been no better answer, but ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah! Again, and followed up with, with a humbug. Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What can I be? returned the uncle. Where I live is such a world of fools as this. Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What Christmas time? To but a time for paying bills without money, a time for finding oneself yourself about a year older, but an hour richer, a time for balancing your books, having every item of them for a round dozen of months presented dead against you. If I could will my work my will, said Scrooge indignantly. Every idiot who comes about Merry Christmas, lit would be boiled with his own pudding, and buried with a stake of holly for his heart he should. Uncle pleaded the nephew. Nephew, replied it, Uncle Stanley, keep Christmas in your own way. Let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeats Scrooge's nephew. But you don't keep it. Let me alone. Let me leave it alone then. The Scrooge, much good may it do to you. Much good it has done for you. Ever done for you. There are many things from which I might have my good, by which I have not profited. I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the rest. But I'm sure I've always thought of Christmas time it come round, apart from the variation, due to the sacred name and origin. If any belongings to it be apart from that a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, any time I know of in the good long calendar of the year, where men and women seem to be one constant to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below and them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave, not another race of creatures bound on their other journey. Therefore, Uncle, though it was never but a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, 
I believe it's done done me good and will do me good. I say God bless it. The clerk in a tank were involuntarily applauded, becoming immediately sensible of the priority, poked the fire, extinguished the first frail spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge. You'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, added turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go to, to Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come dine with me us tomorrow. Scrooge said he could not. He would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went to all length of expression and said he would see him in the stream. Shimmery first. But why? cried Uncle Stuart. Nephew, because you never why? Why did you get married? said Scrooge. Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, Brad Scrooge. If there were only one thing in the world, or a dickness and a Merry Christmas, good afternoon. Nay, Uncle, you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it a reason for not com- coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing for you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I'm sorry with my all my heart. Find you so resolute. We never had any quarrel which I've been a party, but I have been I made trial in homage to Christmas. I'll keep my Christmas home to last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. And a happy new year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. And nephew his nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding it. Notwithstanding. He stopped. At the outer door, they bestowed the greetings of the season, the clerk. The clerk, who cold as he was, the woman went to Scrooge, for he turned and called him. There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. My clerk, with fifteen shillings a week, a wife and a family, talking about a merry Christmas, I retired to Bedlam. Ertick and letting Scrooge's nephew out. I had only let two people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold. Now stood with their hats off. In Scrooge's office, they had books and papers in their hands, and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, the one a gentleman was referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Scrooge had been dead for these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago at this very night. We have no doubt he's at liberty, as well as did by his surviving partner, said the gentleman presenting credentials. Cunny was... For well, they had been two kindred spirits. I must word liberty. Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. As this season, first this season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, in more than usual to my old, we should have some slight provision for the poor, desolate, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands of old want of common necessaries. Hundreds of common thousands are in want common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Scrooge Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down a pen again. And union workhouses? You don't mind Scrooge? Are they still in operation? They are still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could would say that it were not. The gentleman, poor law, in full vigour then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. I was afraid from what you said at first. Something had occurred to stop them in their use, useful course, said Scrooge. I'm very glad to hear it. And the impression that they're scarcely furnished. Christian cheered the mind and body to the multitude, turned the gentleman. A few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund by a poor some meat and drink, a means of warmth. We choose his time because it's all in me. It is time that all others and want is keenly felt at Ambulance rejoices. Why should I put you down for nothing? replied Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't want to make merry of myself at Christmas. Can't afford to make either people merry. They help to support the establishments mentioned. They cost enough. They, who are badly off, must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it, and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know it. That I don't know that. Do you know that? But you know that you might now know it, Sir Didiman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a gentleman to stand his own business. I feel that other people's mind occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. 
Soon and clearly it would be useless to pursue their point. Gentlemen withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours, improved opinion of himself, in a more fatuous temper than was usual for it with him. Meanwhile the fog of darkness thickened, so the people ran about the flaring links, pre offering their services to go before horses and carriages conduct them on their way. The ancient town of the church, whose gruff old bell was always peering, peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of the coffee window at the wall, came invisible, struck the hours and quarters, the clouds, the tremendous vibrations, others with its teeth were chattering and froze in the head up there, the cold came intense, main street the corner of the court, some labourers were repairing the gas pipes, had lighted a great fire in a brazier, round which a pretty, which a party ragged men and boys were gathered, all in the hands of wrinkling their eyes before the blaze in rapture, the water plug being left in the solitude, so overflowing suddenly with good yield, turned to misanthropic ice. Her brightness of shops, who where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat, the windows made pale faces ruddy, ruddy as they pass, potolotras and grocers' trades. There came a splendid joke, a glorious pageant, which is next impossible to leave such dull principles, a bargain sell everything to do. The old man of stronghold and mighty mansion house gave orders with fifty cooks and butlers, keep Christmas and Lord Mayor's household should. Even a little tailor whom you find five shillings on the previous Monday was being drunk and bloodthirsty in the street, stirred up tomorrow's pudding, he's gone it, while his lean wife and baby sallied out to buy the beef. Foggy yet and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold, if if the good scent Dunson had but nipped the evil spirit's nose a touch of such weather as that instead of using his familiar weapons. Indeed, should have roared so lustily to lusty purpose. The owner one scant young nose gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold's bones, and gnawed by dogs stopped, stooped down and carol Scrooge's keel, a girl with a Christmas carol. At the, fir- at the sound, at the first sound of God bless you, merry gentlemen, nothing you can dismay. Scrooge sees a ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more could chill frost. A length of hours shutting up the counting house arrived. But here we all, Scrooge is mounted from his stall and tacitly admitted the fact, respected the clerk and looked in the clerk town tank. Insistently snuffed Kennel out and out put on his hat. You want all day tomorrow, I suppose, Scrooge. If it were quite convenient, sir. It is not convenient, said Scrooge. It's not fair. You stop if I was to stop half of the city for it. You think yourself ill used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill used when I pay a day's wages for no work. Clark observed it's only once a year. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every twenty fifth of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin. I suppose you must have the golf all day. Be here all the, the earlier next morning. Clark promised that he would. Scrooge walked out the ground. The office was closed and twinkled. Clark, long ends of his white comforter, dangling below his work hoist, for he boasted no great coat, great coat, and down at a slide on coin. The end of a lane of boys twenty times in honour of it being Christmas Eve, then ran home to Camp Town as hard as he could pelt, lay to play at Buff Diamond Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner to his usual melancholy tavern, having read all the newspapers, and beguiled the rest of the evening with banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which once belonged to his seat's partner. There was a gloomy suit of cloak rooms, low in pile of building up a yard where it had little, so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there, have run there. There was a young house playing a hide and seek. Other houses forgotten the way out again. 
It's old enough now. It drew enough that nobody lived in it. The Scrooge in other rooms, being all let out as offices. The arm was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew it, every stone was fain. The groped with his hands, fog and frost go over. So hung about the black old great way the house. It seemed as if the genius of ever sat in mournful meditation on the threshold. Now it is a fact there's nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door except it was very large. Also the fact the Scrooge has seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also the Scrooge had a little what is called fancy about him, as any man in the city of London, even including so it's, uh, which is a bold word, corporation, ottoman and library, library. Let it in also be the home to mind that Scrooge did not spoil one fault by Lavali since his last mention of his luck, his seven years dead partner that afternoon, and let and then let any man explain to me if he can. How he appeared at Scrooge, having his key to the lock of the door, saw on the knocker that he's undergoing any immediate process of change. Not a knocker, but Marley's face. My face is not impregnable shadow as the other subject objects in the yard there were. For he had a dismal light about him, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. He was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look. Ghostly spectacles turned up his ghostly forehead. The hair was cursely stirred, it did by breath from the hot air, and through the eyes wide open, the eyes were open, and through the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That in livid colour made it horrible, but its horror seemed to be in spite of the face, beyond its control rather than part of its own expression. The Scrooge looked fixedly at his phenomenon, is a knocker again. To say he was not startled, that his blood was not conscious, the terrible sensation, which it had been a stranger from infancy, would be untrue. He put his hand upon the key, clenched it, quenched, turned it sturdily, walked in and lighted the candle. He did pause for a moment's irresolution. Before he shut the door, he did look cautiously, hiding first. It is he expected to be terrified, sighting Marley's pigtail, Sticking out into the hall, there's nothing on his back on the door. Set the screws and nuts and the, the hell knock on it on. So he said, pew, pew, and closed it with a bang. Sound resounded through the house. A thunder, every room above and every cask in the waste of the merchant's cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Screws are not manned and frightened by echoes. Closed the door and walked across the wall, up the stairs slowly. Two trimming his candles, his candle as he went. He may talk vaguely, but driving a coach of six by a good old fashion, up a good flight, gold, good, oh, good old flight of stairs, or even a bad young act of parliament. I meant to say you might have got a hearse up that staircase, even it, and taken it broadwise, the spinder bar down so, towards the bowl, the bar, door towards the ban- banisters. Done it easy. There was plenty of whip for that. Room despair, which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge for it he saw a locomotive hearse going on before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out of the street would have lighted the hard entry too well. So you may suppose a pretty dark room with Scrooge with Scrooge's, Scrooge's dip. Uh, Scrooge went, not caring a butter for that. Darkness is cheap and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face desired to do of the face desired to do that. Sitting room, dining bedroom, number room, all as they should be. Nubby on the table, nubby on the sofa, small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, a little saucepan of gruel. Scrooge had it cold in his head, pond and hog. Nubby under the bed, nubby in the closet, nubby in the dressing room. Which is hanging out in a suspicious attitude, attitude against the wall. Lumber room also, as usual. Old fire got old shoes, for two fresh baskets. Wash stand, wash stand, and three legs and poker.
For it satisfied each closed his door, locked himself in, double locked himself in, was not his custom, thus secured against surprise. He took his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers, his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his call. A very low fire, indeed, nothing on such a bright, bitter night. He obliged to sit close to it, brood over it, for he could extract the least accession of warmth which for such handful fuel. Fireplace was an old one, built by some Dutch merchant long ago, paved all around with quaint Dutch tales, side and straight with scriptures, with canes and abels, pharaoh waters, queens of Sheba, and ejected messages descending through the air on clouds like feather beds. Abraham behaves of hearts, puzzles, playing out of the sea in butter boats, hundreds of figures to track his faults, and yet the face of Marley's seven years dead came like the ancient prophet's rod, and swallowed up the whole. If each moved here, tell had been a blank at first, a power to shape some picture and a surface from his disjointed fragments of his faults, there would have been a copy of old Molly's head, and every one humbug, said Scrooge, and walked and walked across the room. After several turns he sat down again. He threw his head back in the chair, he glanced, happened to Rest upon a bell, disused bell, hung on the, in the room, committed with some purpose, forgotten, a forgotten wood chamber, the highest story, the building. It was a great astonishment, with a strange, inexplicable dread. As he looked at and saw the bell, began to swing. So it swung, so, it, so, it swung so softly, outset, it scarcely made a sound. It sound, it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted only a minute, or lasted half a minute, or a minute. It seemed an hour. A bell ceased as they had begun. Together they succeeded by a cranking noise deep down below. Some person was dragging a heavy chain over the cast of the weather by merchant cellar. Scrooge had remembered to have heard ghosts of haunted houses described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open. A booming sound, and then he heard a voice much louder on the floor below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards the door. It was a humbug. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. Won't believe it. The colour changed, though. Without a pause, came for the heavy door, passing the room. Before his eyes, upon it coming in, a dying flame leapt up, as though it cried, I know him, my ghost. And fell again. Marley's ghost, the same face, the same very same Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots and tassels, and latter bursting his pigtail, the skin coat skirts, the hair upon his head, the chain he drew was clasped about his middle. With long and worn, bat him like a tail. It was made for Scrooge observed it closely. Cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, steeds, heavy pur- purses, walked in sail still. His body is transparent, so that Scrooge observing him, observing him, looking through his waistcoat, to see the two buttons in the coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said to Molly, and her bows, he had never believed it until now. Nor did he believe it even now, though he looked the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him. Though he felt the chilling with influence of its deaf, cold eyes and marked the very touch of the throaty cankankerchief bound about his head and chin which wrapper he did not observe before, nor observe before, he was still incredulous and fought against his senses. How now, said Scrooge, crustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? March, Harley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who are you then? said Scrooge, raising his voice. You're particular. You're for, for particular for a shade. He's going to say the shade. The simply do this but it's more appropriate. In life I was your partner, Jacob Barley. Can you, can you sit can you sit down and ask Scrooge, looking faithfully at him? I can. Do it then, Scrooge, ask the questions. 
I didn't know whether a ghost, so parents, parent might find itself just to take a chair. Felt that in the event of it being impossible, it might be involved in necessary of embarrassing its explanation. The ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if it were quite used to it. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have? My reality, we all that your senses. I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, I don't know that thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheeks. You know, maybe just a bit of beef. And just a bit of beef. A blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an gone, gone potato. Is more gravy. Is more gravy than a gravel grave about you. Whatever you are, Scrooge was not much the habit. Cracky Jinks, nor did he feel his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is, he tried to be smart, as means distracting his own attention, and keeping down his terror, for the spectre's voice disturbed the very marrow he bones. He's to sit, staring those fixed, glazed eyes in silence for a moment. The play Scrooge felt very deuce with him, and something very awful too, the spectre's being provided with an infernal atmosphere of its own. Scrooge could not feel it himself, but this was a clean good case. For though the spirit ghost sat motionless, pretty firmly motionless, hair and skirts and tassels, still agitated by the hot vapour from an oven. You see this toothpick, said Scrooge, returning quickly by the chart for the chart to charge. Reason that just a sign, wishing that he was only a second, the vert of which regions, so he gave to himself. I do, replied the ghost. Only you're not looking in it, said George Scrooge. I and but I do, I see it, said George, notwithstanding. Well, we turned Scrooge, I put to shadow this. I be for the rest of my days persecuted. A legion of goblins, all my own creation. Humbug, I call you humbug. This spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain, and such a dismal, appalling noise. Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling and swoon. But how much greater was his horror! The fan had taken off a bandage round its head, so if it were too warm, wearing doors. The lower jaw dropped down to its big breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees and glanced his hands for his face. Mercy, said, dreadful in his admiration. Why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, cried Ghost. Do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge. I must, but by do spirits walk on the earth? Why did he come to me? It's quiet of every man, Ghost returned. The spirit within him should walk among abroad, among his fellow men, and travel far and wide his trouble. But it does not go forth in life. Came to do so after death. It do the wonderful of the world. Oh, woe is me, witness. Well, you cannot share the might have shared on earth, and turned to happiness. The inspector raised a cry and shook its chain and rang its shadowy hands. You are fettled, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. Uh, where the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I gilded it on my own, of my own free will. And of my own free will will I work. I wore it. Is this pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Oh, would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and length of a strong quill. You bear yourself. It is full of heavy, as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have laboured on it, since it is a pr- pr- ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor. The expectation of finding himself surrounded by fifty, sixty fathoms of iron cable. He could, but he could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly. Oh, Jacob Bonnie, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, there, replies the Scrooge, convey my other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. Little more, very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, 
cannot linger anywhere. Bread never walk beyond our scantiness. Mark me, the life my spirit never roves beyond. There are limits of our money, changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. How it's a scrooge ever, if become thoughtful. With his hands reach his pockets. Pointing what the ghost has said, he did so now, without lifting up his eyes or getting off his knees. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob. So Scrooge observed in business like manner, though it, though with humanity and deferent reference, though the ghost replied, so in his dead Scrooge, and travelling and travelling all the time, whole time, so ghost no rest, no place, incident, torch, incessant, torture, remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied Ghost. You must have got over. You must have got over a good quantity of ground in, in seven years, said Scrooge. Ghost on hearing this, said of another crying, clanked its chain, said it be hissily in a dead silence of night. The world would have been justified in indicating it for a nuisance. Oh, capture bound and double lion, cried the phantom. Do not know that age of incessant labour. The immortal creatures that is worth the past eternity before the good of which I am susceptible in all developed. But now to know that when he Christian spirit, when cunning is the little spear, wherever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its loss, for a means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret that even amends for one's life's opportunity, misuse, is not yet, yet such as I. Oh, such as I. But you were always a good man with business. Jacob, thought it was Scrooge, had been now begin to apply this for, for himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing his hands together. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, fairness, barbarians and benevolence were all my business. Dealings of my trade were but a drop of the water in a comprehensive ocean of my business. It held its chains at arm's length. It was the cause of all its unraveling grief, and flung it heavily upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, the picture said, I have suffered most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes closed, turned down, and never raised them to the blessed star, led to wise men to pour the world, where there were no piles of which its light would have converted me? Brutal very much dismayed to hear the spectre, Going on at this rate, began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I will, said Scrooge. I don't, but don't be too hard upon me. Don't be flurry, Jacob Perry. Pray, now is that. How is it that I appear before you a shape that you can see? I cannot, I may not tell. I have sat invisible, so I do many, a many a day. It's not a grim idea. Scrooge shivered and swiped the preparation for his brow. There's no light part in my penitence. Go push the ghost. I am here tonight. But warn you, you must get that you have not have yet to get a chance. I hope you uh, hope escape your eye faint. A chance of hope of procuring Ebenezer. You're always a good friend to me, says Scrooge, thinking. You'll be haunted, resume the ghost by free spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghosts had done. Gone. Is there no chance you hope you mention Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I think I'm wrong or not, said Scrooge. Without their visit, said the ghosts, you cannot hope to shun the path they tread. Expect the verse tomorrow when the devil bell told one. Could I tell them all at once, have it over, Jacob? cried hidden Scrooge. I expect the second on every night, sex night at the same hour, but upon the next night, when the last stroke of twelve, the sea so very, look to see me no more. Look for that, for your own sake. You remember that this path between us. When it was said these words, Spectre looked, took its wrapper on the table and bound it round its head. As before, Scrooge knew this, the short sound of its teeth, Made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage, he ventured to raise his eyes again. Fanny said, provincial visitor, confronted him in an erect attitude. The chain wound over 
and about his arm. Apparition walked backwards from him, and every step it took the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach with it, which he did. But only within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hands, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped. Not so much in obedience as a surprise and fear, but of one raising the hand, he became sensible of confused noises, and the air wailings inexpressible, sorrowful, sorrowful, and self century Spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in a mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak night. Scrooge followed it to the window. Desperate and recurrently, he looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste, and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghosts. So few they might be guilty governments, were leaped together, none were free. Many a profession personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost, a white waistcoat, monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried pitifully, being unstable, sister of a wretched woman with an infant, whom it saw below, under a doorstep, and measuring with them all was clearly what had sought to interfere for good. Human vassals had lost the power for ever. Wherever the creatures faded into the mist, the most had strode them, he could not tell, but they and his spirit voices faded together. A light became as it had been when he walked home. Crew closed the window, examined the door, which the ghost had entered, double locked as he ended up it with his own hands. Box of undisturbed, he stayed to say, humbug. We stopped the first syllable, and being from motion, he undergo all the fatigues of days, glimpse if it's a world, a dull conversation of ghosts, or ladies of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. <laughs>